cover the return from Babylonian exile by the Jews. So we have talked about how they ended up in exile, how they came back out of exile, the processes by which they went to rebuild Jerusalem. They started with rebuilding the altar, then they started to rebuild the temple, and then they faced opposition, and then they didn't do anything, um, and they kind of just sat on their haunches. So if you would like to catch up with us, you can find old messages on YouTube. You can search Pastor Pat Edrington, uh, and it should pull up the vintage church stuff. You can find old messages that way, or you can get on Facebook, on our Facebook page, uh, and we post we try to post the messages, but they are all on YouTube. Uh, you can catch back up that way if you would like to do that. Today, uh, we're going to talk about um, something that is near and dear to my heart, uh, something that I uh, am very, very good at, but not very proud of being good at, uh, because it pertains to what we're going to look at when we start talking about these guys coming back. Um, and so that thing being... Uh, procrastination. Now, if you don't know, um, I struggle sometimes with actually getting done the thing that I'm supposed to be doing because I get distracted by various things around me. But I'm not the worst person that I know in the world with this. There's people out there who are worse than me. And so when I have my procrastination moments, I go, well, at least I'm not that guy. <laughs> right? That's how you're supposed to approach my favorite procrastination story ever is I had a buddy in college who he took medication for his procrastination. He was a high, he was ADHD before that was cool to be ADHD. And so he uh, he had a paper that if he did not get his paper this paper done, it was a 10 page paper about uh, Exodus and about Moses and about archaeological proof for the Exodus. Doesn't that sound riveting to write 10 pages on? He had to write this paper. And so he came to us as a sprint group and he's like, guys, I've put this paper off and I've put this paper off. I've known for three months I'm supposed to do the paper and I haven't done the paper and the paper's due tomorrow. And I need you guys' help to do the paper. And I was like, buddy, I don't know how we can help you at this point write a 10 page term paper that you've not done anything for. And he's like, well, I've, I've got the books. I'm like, what do you mean you've got the books? And he's like, I went a couple weeks ago and I checked the books out. So I have all the books. I'm like, okay, well, you got started, but that's, I'm not reading your books on Exodus archaeology. That ain't happening. I go, here's what we can do. I will clear the dorm floor for you. Because um, our dorm floor was very similar to uh, living in a circus. Um, it just was chaos because it's a Christian college, so nobody, there's no drinking, there's no, and then everybody um, is doing their best to maintain Christian attitudes about sexuality, so we're not spending any time with the opposite sex because nobody has any control. So you're just by yourself, and the further at all, you're in Lincoln, Illinois, where literally there's nothing to do. <laughs> nothing. Kroger closes at 9 o'clock. <laughs> when we were there. Like, Walmart closed at 9. It, nine. The whole town turns off at 9 o'clock. So, a lot of times, that's when we were getting out of bed. So, our dorm floor, like, they, we like fire. We had bonfire hallways. We had, like, that's a terrible idea. Don't do that, by the way. Um, we, we would do floor slides where you would, like, you would be sitting at your desk trying to work on homework, and they would yell, towel your door, and then you knew if you didn't get a towel in the door, you were going to have gallons of water in your dorm room because somebody was plugging the showers in the bathroom and flooding water out onto the floor. And then these guys would put on swim trunks sometimes and slide <laughs> down the floor. So like you'd be, you'd have the door open and you would see like men sliding by your door. And you're like, now how am I supposed to do homework in that sense? So all that's what's going on. So I say to my buddy, listen, you got to get that paper done. I'll make sure this floor. Nothing happens. We will leave. We will go to Steak and Shake. We'll go hang out. So we'll get you. So we have, uh, we leave him sitting at his little computer under his little loft bed. And, you know, like, it's just a sad, sad case. And you walk by the door, and he's like, all right, guys, I'm going to do it. So we go to Dixie, which was like the truck stop halfway between Bloomington and Lincoln, because they're over 24 hours. And we get pancakes, because pancakes come from heaven. And we eat our pancakes. We're gone for four hours. We come home. We walk in. He's still sitting there. I look at the paper on the computer. He's written his name and the title of the paper. I go, what are you doing? He goes, well, here's what happened. 
He goes, I, you guys left and I had full intention. So then I started to lay my books out. Well, then I, when I was laying the books out, I noticed that some of the books are taller than the other books. So then I stacked the books up in equal height. And then when I stacked the books up in equal height, I got to look at the books on my bookshelf and realized they were not organized by that. So then I organized the books on my shelf. And then when I organized the books on my shelf, I sat back down and I had my notepad and I looked down and I didn't have a pencil. Oh. So I got up and then he said, my roommate didn't have a pencil. So then and you guys are all gone. So all the dorms are, all the rooms are locked. I can't get find a pencil. So then I go up and I knock on the dorm dad's door. He's not home, but his wife said he's over at the, at the gym right now for open gym. So I walked over to open gym. I asked him if he had a pencil. He didn't have a pencil. So then I got in my car and I went down to, um, to Walmart to buy a pencil, but I forgot my wallet. So I had to come back <laughs> here. And I came back and got my wallet. And then I went back and I got my pencil. And then I came back and then I sat down. And I'm like, I really don't need a pencil because I have a computer. And I'm like, you're an idiot. <laughs> so then he got mad that we were making fun of him um, for being dumb. And we were calling him Tommy. He didn't like that. Um, so then he gets in a big wrestling match with my roommate in the hallway. And needless to say, at like 4 o'clock in the morning, he sends this email to his Old Testament professor and says, I am very sick and don't think I'm going to be able to complete this paper. May I have an extra day? At which point the Old Testament professor the next day sends me back, mail back, just give me the paper before the end of the semester. I can't with you. Procrastination. <laughs> That's how it works, right? And then, right, you hear that story, oh, well, at least he got the extra time and he probably did the paper then, right? No! That's not how people with procrastination brain work. When you get the thing that says you can have it at the end of the semester, you ain't doing that paper till the end of the semester. So he's like, out of sight, out of mind. So we just were like, bro, you got it. are you going to do it? So it was clear to the end before he got that paper done. But that's kind of how procrastination works. And when you read this story then in Ezra, that's kind of where we end off in the end of chapter 4. Remember, they have all this opposition, and they're not rebuilding, and they're not doing those things. And God sent them back there to rebuild, right? That's why they're supposed to be there. You came here because you're supposed to be uh, rebuilding the temple. So when you pick up in chapter 5, it says, Now the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who was over them. Now you may read that and go, that doesn't seem that interesting, and how in the world did you get procrastination out of that? Well, let me tell you about the Old Testament. We know when we read the prophets Haggai and Zechariah that if you flip through your Bible, there are two books called Haggai and Zechariah. Same guys. So if you wonder what Haggai says to them, you can actually go to the book of Haggai. You go to chapter 1. Here's what it says. This is Haggai chapter 1, 1 through 11. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to the hand of Haggai, the prophet to Jerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Remember, looking for names for kids? A whole bunch there for you. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your panel houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much and you've harvested little. If you ever wanted a definition of procrastination, these, these lines that Haggai says that God gives to him is the best description for procrastination I've ever heard. Listen, he says this. You've sown much and you've harvested little. You've done a whole lot. You've not done anything. You eat, but you've never had enough. You drink, you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one's warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into bags with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hill... Bring wood and build the house, that I might take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, it blew away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withdrew the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and all of their labors. Okay, God is not happy with the Jewish procrastination. And he says to them, you're doing a whole lot, 
to little avail. You're doing a whole lot of stuff to make it look like you're accomplishing something, but you're not accomplishing anything at all. This reminds me of playing football. We had, a run, we had two running backs on the team I played on. One running back was built like a brick house. And there was nothing flashy about it. Every play, you'd hand the ball to Ryan, and all Ryan would do would run downhill, and he would just look for the first guy to run into. And he averaged five or six yards of carry, and he was incredible. But it wasn't flashy, and it wasn't good. And then we had the other kid that you'd hand him the ball, and he wanted to dance around in the backfield, try to juke everybody, try to fake him out, and he always got knocked down in the backfield. And our coach used to say, you're dancing a lot left and right, but you're not going anywhere where you need to be going. Stop dancing around and get where you're supposed to be or you're not going to be getting anywhere. Which is essentially what God is saying to these guys. Hey, listen, you've done all this. You've gone even as far to put, you paneled your house. You don't have just a regular house. You didn't just put a roof over your head so you had some place to live while you rebuilt the temple that I brought you out of Babylonian exile that nobody said you'd be able to come out of. And I led you back here and promised you you would do this. And the first sight of any opposition you've just thrown in the towel, you went as far to make your house ornate. You prettied up your house. You're like, well, look at, look at what I've done over here. And he's like, well, because of that, because you're so focused on the things that are all about you, that you're not doing the thing I've called you to do, I'm going to send drought on every aspect of the land you live in. Listen, he doesn't say I'm just going to send drought that you're not going to have rain. He's like, you're not going to, like, produce isn't going to grow, you're not going to grow, your animals aren't going to grow, like, nothing's going to work. Everything you do is going to be in vain until you build my temple. Well, why? Well, because God knows that the relationship they had is symbolically put into place if the temple exists. If they come out of Babylonian exile and they come back to a pagan world and they declare to that pagan world, our God is the God of gods and he empowers us and through him we can do all things and then they can't even rebuild the temple, what does that say about their God? So God's frustrated with them because their procrastination is keeping people from knowing who God is. Which let me tell you, has been real convicting this week when you think about your own life. Because I think we live in a world that sometimes that's how we do our own faith. It's real easy inside of Christianity to fall into the trap of thinking you've got to have all your ducks in a row before you can do what God's called you to do. We love to play this game in Christianity. Well, I'm just praying it through. I'm just believing God will give me a sign. I'm putting that fleece out in front of him and seeing what he tells me. You know, if I just spend enough time in the Word, if I just pray enough, if I just think this through enough, if I just talk to the right people, if I just do this or if I just do that, then I'll, you know, then I'll be able to get done what I need to get done. But then they don't, you never do it. You don't ever do it. You just spend all your time making up excuses for why you're not capable to do the thing God's called you to do, trying to do a bunch of stuff to prepare yourself to do the thing that God's already called you to do. Part of faith is stepping out and doing things that you don't <laughs> think are possible. Just was talking to a buddy this week about church planning. And I said, the one thing vintage has taught me is, you know when you are in God's will... When it feels like you are drowning in the deep end. And they're like, that's not encouraging. And I'm like, I'm not trying to not encourage you. What I'm telling you is there's been multiple moments with vintage that I have just said, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know. You just got to shut up and sit back and let God drive the, drive the plane. Because we don't know what we're doing. But... What I do know is you have to allow God to do the driving, meaning you've got to put yourself in a place that he can do the driving. You can't just atrophy and go into moratorium and just sit and wait because you're trying to find the perfect spot, the perfect moment, and the perfect plan, and the perfect program, and the perfect everything so that then you can get this perfect existence. That's not what we're called to do. We're not perfect. You're not. And if you go out into this world and you try to present, listen, we're we, down there at that vintage. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. They are perfect. 
They never make any mistakes. They hit each other with hammers and they don't cuss. They yell out hallelujah. They got the Lord in them. Nobody's angry. Nobody's mad. Nobody falls short. Nobody makes bad choices. Nobody sins. Nobody messes up. They are a perfect example of a perfect God. Woo, you should be a part of Then the first time that you sinners act like sinners, what happens? The world goes, what a bunch of hypocrites. Listen, God needs your imperfection in the world so that he can show his perfection at work in you. God needs you to take steps of faith and do and say things that feel out of place and uncomfortable for you because he's called you to rebuild the temple. See, we've talked about the Bible and its narrative because it's the same, right? It's the same in the old as it is in the new. It's sin. Sin leads to isolation. When we're in isolation, we can recognize being in complete and total darkness isn't fun. I don't like it here. There's a crying out to God, and then God hears that cry and brings us out of darkness. That's called an exodus. And then out of the exodus, you come back into restoration. And then restoration is always connotated by the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the altar, and sacrifice for sin, and restoration back to what God wanted you to be. For us, in our story, in our line of that, how do we rebuild the temple? Well, the New Testament teaches that God's temple in the New Testament is not brick and stone and wood and nails. The New Testament temple is people. So if you want to rebuild the temple of God in this world, then we need to be adding people to it. The more people you have, the bigger the temple. And it's not the more people with the more butts and seats that we can post videos and talk about how great we are. Right? It's not so that we can stand up and go, well, now down there in Vintage, we've got 150 people coming on Sundays, praise the Lord, and our tithe offering is enormous. We're handing out free Bibles and free food and hugging everybody who comes to the door, whether they like it or not. Praise the Lord, look how great we are. No, the drive here is to add people because we want people to be restored out of darkness. There should be a thing in you, there should be a desire and a, a worry inside of you like there is in these guys that if we don't do this thing that God has called us to do, then God is going to pull his blessing from us. He's going to remove himself from from us. And so we always need to keep mindful of the fact if you call yourself a believer in Jesus, then that should radicalize about the way you view and see people in this world from the place of you should have a desire to be rebuilding God's temple because when you discover who you are supposed to be in Jesus, there should be a reconciliation inside of your brain to bring you out of darkness and say, oh, I have purpose and design, and I have meaning and reason. God made me to love people. God made me to care for people. God gave me talents and abilities to advance his kingdom. God's called me to do these certain things, and I'm being faithful to do them because I want to see other people who are like me, who see the world like I see it. I want to see them have the same reconciliation and restoration moment when they realize I'm not lost in darkness. I'm not hopeless. I'm not, there's, I can be reached because he was reached. She was reached. Look who they were and look who they are now. There should be a thing in you that burns to tell people you don't have to stay lost in darkness because God came to earth and died and resurrected for the forgiveness of sin. This is not hyperbole. This is not myth. This is not made up story handed down through generations. This thing happened. This thing took place and a bunch of wayward sons and daughters saw God live and breathe and because of that they went into the world and told people about it. They didn't procrastinate. They didn't build a temple on the mountain where he ascended into heaven. They went out into the world and said there is hope in the dark. There is light in the dark. There is freedom from sin. There is restoration of the oppressor and the victim. There is a God who loves you, cares about you, and has a plan for you. Work his hands. Work his feet. Look at our life. Look at who we were. Look who we are now. You need to be restored. And if your mind is not burned like that, if you don't see the world that way, if that's not what's put in you, then you need to have a moment where you wake up and ask yourself, are you truly 
truly restored? And do you really understand what Christ has done for you? Because if you do, then there should be a desire to rebuild the temple. Or are you like these Jews this morning who forgot they just came out of Babylonian exile? They just came out of a place that nobody said you'll ever come out of. Nobody ever conquered Babylon. We're not talking about some little podunk city that got run over. It had never been defeated. That's where they were. A pagan stronghold. You're not sitting them in a city where it's like, well, give it a minute, because we get run over all the time here. You're not going to be here forever. Seventy years they sat in a place that the world said is unconquerable. And God said, hold on. Maybe you didn't get the memo. I'm still God. I still have a plan. And even though the world says this is where you are, that's not where I say you are. So I've got you there for a season, but you're not going to be there forever. And then when Cyrus conquers them, like we said, he does it overnight. He does it in a way that when the Babylonians woke up in the morning, they didn't even know they'd been conquered. History records, you can read in their writings that they woke up and realized, oh, I guess we're Persian. Can you imagine like if you woke up tomorrow, well, I guess we're Chinese. Nobody told us. How'd that happen? We showed up in the night. Nobody was ready. That's what God does to bring them back. And when he brings them back, he says, now rebuild my temple. And at the first sign of opposition, they throw the towel in. Well, they're mean to us, and they're picking on us, and it's scary. And what's everybody going to think? And, you know, like, look, let's just, we'll just build these houses over here. We'll just make a really safe space. Right? This world loves safe spaces. We love them. You've got to have a safe space where you can say what you want and be who you want. Nobody can take that from you. We're going to create a safe space, a little bubble to live in, where you don't have to interact with that big, mean, evil world that's out there going to try to kick you. And we're going to pad the walls and everybody's going to eat ice cream and talk about how wonderful it is in here. And all of Rome will burn around us. But our house will be safe. Our friends and family will march right into hell, but that'll be okay because we've got pretty curtains. Right? Our friends and family are going to die lost in darkness, but hey, I feel safe in here. Did you see my pillows? We bought new pillows. We put them on our exorbitant couches. It's been nice for us. We've created a space that's safe. We don't have to interact with this scary world. That's why Haggai has to say the things that he has to say. Which then when you go back to Ezra, it makes sense then in chapter 2, when you get back to verse 2, it says, In Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, and Yeshua, the son of Josedach, arose and began to rebuild the house of God. It's in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. Now we know the prophets are with them. That means God supports what they're doing. So God is in the action. Like, look, I called you to rebuild the temple. If you don't, we're going to have a drought. The whole world's going to fall apart. Zerubbabel and Yeshua are right up to go, we better rebuild the temple. We do not. We've learned. He pulled us out of that long. I think he can squash us. Okay, let's do this. Verse 3, though. At the same time, Cat and I, there you go, another name and name your kid. The governor of the province beyond the river and Shephazar Bozene, ding dong. And their associates came to them and spoke to them thus Who gave you a decree to build this house and to finish this structure? They also asked him this What are the names of the men who are building this building? But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius, and then an answer be returned by letter concerning it. So the difference is this time. You still have opposition. You have this cat and I, you have these guys, and we know these guys exist outside. You can find, you know, the references. In the, so these guys are real people. They go, they show up and like, who, who told you you could do this? And these Jews, they're good Jews. They're like, we're building a wall and don't care about you. <laughs> Who's, who are you? What's your, we're going to write your names down. Go ahead and write them down, but we're not stopping. Because if we can't, we're not going to get any rain. Like, God says no rain till his house is built. So, we like rain, and we're more scared of no rain. So, you can be angry, but we're just going to keep right on doing this. Well, we're going to go tell Darius, okay, well, he's that way, but we're still here doing this thing. What if we approach opposition that way? 
Well, Pat, we don't really fix opposition like that in America. That's not what we go through. Which is kind of true, but it's kind of not. Listen, if you've been real wayward and been a real turd, if you show up <laughs> and you say, I'm not going to be that anymore, right? If you show up to your friends like, hey, listen, guys, I love you, but I can't hit the bar every Friday night. And it's not because I think you being at the bar is necessarily sinful. It's not because I think having a beer every now and then is sinful. It's because it's created a problem for me. It's made a thing in my life and this idol in my life that when I do that thing, I be something that I don't want to be. And God's called me out of darkness and I'm trying to live a restored life and I'm trying to be a good thing. And so for a season, this thing that isn't necessarily evil in and of itself is evil for me. So I'm not going to come out. I'm not going to go do that thing anymore because I'm trying to be this thing. When you have that conversation, you don't think you're going to face opposition? You don't think you're going to have unsaved, non-unbelieving darkness people say to you, well, that's stupid? That's why I hate, that's why I hate religion. I was trying to take everything from the way. What do you mean you can't come hang out at the bar? Well, when I hang out at the bar, I get hammer drunk. I don't know who I am, and I go home with people that I don't know, and I make terrible decisions, and I wake up on Saturday with a hangover, sit next to somebody, I don't know who they are, and I wonder what's going on in my life. And I've been doing that over and over, and every Saturday, and then every Sunday, I'm down there at the church trying to repent and get it right, and I've just been putting it off, and I just keep doing this thing. And I went to the church on Sunday, and he preached this message about procrastination, and I just thought, that's what I'm doing with my life, I'm just procrastinating. Like, I can recognize this thing's not happy, me, making me happy. This thing isn't what I want to be. This thing's not who I'm supposed to be. And so I just made a decision. I don't want to be this thing anymore. And so how do you stop procrastination? Well, you stop just sitting there. So I'm not going to sit there anymore. I'm going to step out. And I'm going to be something different. Watch well, stupid. What am I supposed to do? Now I'm going to be at the bar by myself. <laughs> what about me? Are you saying that God won't love me if I'm at the bar? No, stupid. That's not what I just said. I just said you can go to the bar. I just said, you, there's lots of people who can go to a bar. Bars have delicious food. You can go. That's not the problem. The problem is for me and my life and who I am right now, the enemy has used this thing to define me and make me into something that I don't want to be. And it's become the panel house of my life. I'm just so focused on this thing that what God has for me, I'm not able to do because I keep playing in the dirt. I don't want to play in the dirt anymore. You can. Maybe that's not playing in the dirt for you. Maybe that's just something you do. Pat, I don't think that's how Christianity is supposed to work. I'm pretty sure when I grew up, we could make definitive statements about things that are evil. And it seems like right now, you're saying that what may be evil for you is not evil for me. Yeah! Because that's how the Bible works. That's what it says. The things that I like, my proclivities, the thing the enemy used to make me trip and stumble are going to be different than your things. And what makes the enemy really good at being at the enemy? He knows your things. He's not going to tempt you with stuff that's not tempting. I don't drink. It's not tempting to me. It would never be tempting to me. Right? Like if they show if they, like I'm not going to, I don't like it. I, we didn't grow up in that house. I didn't ever do it. I don't like the way it tastes. I like my drinks to be full of sugar. That's how it should be. <laughs> but hey, listen. That could be my thing, right? Like the devil can show up in my life and go, Hey, listen, I know you got a bunch of stuff to do, but wouldn't it be better just to go buy a giant box of hostess cakes and sit down in front of a TV and watch a movie? Mm -hmm. Yes, it would. <laughs> Check, please. And then three weeks later, you're like, man, I feel like garbage, and I've gained 20 pounds, and I've not gotten anything accomplished, and I've watched 700 movies, and I've eaten 20 gajillion calories, and nothing was accomplished. And how did that happen? The enemy. Like, you've got to be bright enough to recognize these things that are oppressive to you, these things that are out there. And when the world starts to kick back at you and go, well, I think that's stupid. You're always going to be fat. I think that's stupid. You'll be back. You'll be back. I know you'll be back. You can't stay away from here. You can't. You were born here. You were made here. This is who you are. <laughs> That's not true. They don't define you. God defines you. Which is why when you read this story, they go, eh, I don't care. So Tatnight goes back, and you can skip, we'll skip down to verse 17, but before you get there, he basically just writes a letter to Darius that just rehashes the first four chapters of Ezra. Dear Darius, I'm out here at the governor, and there are some Jews. They were there. They're here now. They say you sent them here. That was 20 years ago. They're back here now. They're 
grew with these giant rocks around. I don't know who told them they could move those rocks around. They say Cyrus did, and I don't know if that's true. But they're out here, and they're rebuilding this rock. And they got rocks that are so big, they say it's for a temple, but it might be for a wall. Are you okay with them rebuilding a wall? I wrote down their names. And I'm not happy about it. And I need to have your opinion, which is why he ends it in verse 17. He says, therefore... Seems good to the king, because remember, uh, Darius can squash Cat and I. Let search be made in the royal archives there in Babylon to see whether a decree was issued by Cyrus the king for the rebuilding of this house of God in Jerusalem. Let the king send us his pleasure in the matter. Now I got him. Oh, you're not going to come out here and do this thing anymore? You're not going to be this person anymore? You're going to tell me that God restored you and made you into a new thing? You're going to tell me you're different? You better prove it. You better prove it. I'm going to test your God. I'm going to write him a note. <laughs> Jim's out here, and he is claiming, he is claiming that he no longer has to come to the bar on the weekends. He is claiming he no longer has to drink a fifth of whiskey every night. He is claiming he doesn't have to bet every woman he says hello to after he's three sheets to the wind. And he's claiming all of this because he says, you say, that if he believes that you died and rose again from the grave, that he can become a new creation because you're going to live in him and no longer he will be living, but you will be living in him and you will be guiding his path. You will be helping him make his choices. You will be helping him make his decisions. And all these choices and decisions have put a real kink in my armor. So I'm going to need you to look around down there, find out if that's true. Is this true? Are you really going to restore this thing? Is this really what's going on? First, chapter 6, you get the response. Then Darius, the king, made a decree. Search was, and the search was made in Babylonia in the house of the archives where the documents were stored. In Ecbatana, the citadel that is in the province of Medea, a scroll was found on which this was written, a record. In the first year of Cyrus the king, Cyrus the cream issued a decree concerning the house of God in Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt in the place where sacrifices were offered, and let its foundations be retained. Its height shall be 60 cubits, its breadth 60 cubits, with three layers of great stone and one layer of timber. Let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. Also, let the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that is in Jerusalem, and be brought to Babylon, be restored back to the temple that is in Jerusalem, each to its place. You shall put them in the house of God. Now, therefore, Tatnai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shef, Shefvar Bozne, and your associates, the governors who are in the province beyond the river, keep away. Uh oh. <laughs> Let the work on this house of God alone. Let the governors of the Jew and the elder of the Jew rebuild this house of God on its site. Forever I make this decree regarding what you shall do for these elders of the Jew for their rebuilding of this house of God. The cost is to be paid to these men in full and without delay from the royal revenue, the tribute of the province from beyond the river. Whatever is needed, bulls, rams, Sheeps for burnt offering to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, oil, as the priests of Jerusalem require. Let that be given to them day by day without fail, that they may offer pleasing sacrifice to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Also, I make a decree that if anyone alters this edict, a beam should be pulled out of his house, and he shall be impaled on it, and his house shall be made a dumb hill. May the God who caused his name to dwell there overflow any king or person who shall put on a hand to alter this or to destroy this house of God that is in Jerusalem. I dare you to make a decree. Let it be done with all diligence. Now, if you are Tatnai and you get that letter back, you uh, don't feel real good about yourself. Right? Now you're wandering back down there like, <laughs> Hi. Listen, we talked to Darius and he found the letter from Cyrus. We, my bad. We maybe messed this up a little. So he says we're supposed to facilitate and pay for whatever you need out of the Persian coffers. And if we don't, he's going to come take the main beam out of our home. And he's going to take our body and stick us on it till we bleed out. And then they're going to turn our house into the place where they put the um, excrement from the outhouses. 
So whatever you need, we're here. How'd that happen? Because God's eye was upon them. Your opposition, your people in your life that you are giving weight to and giving credence to, that you're worried they're never going to listen to me, they're never going to accept me, they're never going to think that what is that what I'm saying is true, I'm not smart enough, I'm not educated enough, I'm not spiritual enough, I'm not praying enough, I don't know enough worship songs, I can't quote enough scripture, they're never going to believe me that I'm the voice of God, they aren't going to listen to me. You forget that God lives in you. It's not you talking, it's him. And if you're faithful and you step out and do what he's called you to do, then he will rebuild his temple. You won't. You're not out there fishing by yourself. This isn't your philosophy. You're not trying to convince people to come follow after the teachings of Pat. I'm not out there on the corner like, here's what I think. If you eat enough hostess uh, before six, then you don't get indigestion. Like, we should all worship under that. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is saying, there is a living, breathing God who lives and dwells in me. This is who I was. This is who I am. When I was this thing, I was garbage and I was trash. I made terrible choices. I made terrible decisions. Some of you who knew me probably experienced that person. You have seen who I was. You have seen what I am capable of. This is who I am now. I am a conduit for a living, breathing God that says in spite of my failings, he still has purpose and design. He has called me out of darkness. He has put my foot on the right path, and he is now leading me and guiding me. He has given me the word of God so I can shape my life on how to live and how to walk and how to act. And you can do the same thing. You can come out of darkness, and we can walk together as wayward sons and daughters after a God who loves us and has led us to be what he has called us to be. It's not me you are listening to. It's him through me. It's God speaking through me. And he's talking to directly to you. He's saying to his church, rebuild my temple. Take my message. Take my gospel. Go into all the world. Teach what I taught and what. I will be with you daily. That's what he said when he left. You have that same thing in this Old Testament. The Jews didn't stop rebuilding the temple because God's eye was on them. And they knew, hey, we're going to trust God from here on out. Like, he called us on it. We messed up. We repented. We got back to where we're going to do. And I don't care who comes over that hill. No matter what they say, I don't care. They, you can bring down Darius. Darius can walk down here and go, you better knock it off. And I'm going to go take it up with Yahweh. He told me what to do. And if that's rebellious, if that's counterculture, then so be it. Because his temple built and his power authority on this hill in Zion is more important than your opinion of me and my opinion of you. What God has for people and what God wants for people should be paramount in how you approach everything in this world. And if you are procrastinating, if you are set down waiting for God to do some stupid thing in your life and you're not stepping out and doing what God's called you to do, then you need to repent and take up his mantle and go be Christ in the world. That's what he's called us to do. People are lost in darkness. What I don't understand for Christianity and what I don't understand for all of us, how does that not just burn inside of you? Think about what it is we are saying. What we are saying is that every man, woman, child, every person on this planet is going to have to give account for the sin they were born into. And the account you give is punishable by eternal torment and death. If you don't repent, if you cling to these things that you're worried about people's opinion, if you cling to the hope of making everything perfect and you miss what God has for you, then you are facing eternal punishment from a God who is just. And the only hope that you have is that somebody who has already come out of that, somebody who has already been restored, has enough gumption and enough boldness about their faith to step out and say, baby, you ain't stuck there. You don't have to stay there. This is not who you're supposed to be. This is not what God wants for you. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to be complete. He wants your life to be flowing with his blessing. He wants you to have a good job and a good spouse and a good relationship. 
relationship and children that love you and love God. He wants to restore you and make you back to what he wants you to be. Stop clinging to darkness and death and cling to the cross of Jesus. And if you want proof, look at me. I cling to that cross daily. It's not me speaking. It's that cross speaking through me. He has called his church to restore his temple, and we should not procrastinate for that. This message is perfect for this week because it is Palm Sunday. Now we're going to get into all the, to the logistics of that. That Palm Sunday is the time in the Bible when Jesus came back through the gate and uh, connotated, look, I am the Messiah, come to redeem mankind. And we know that next Sunday is Easter, and Easter is the time for submarine Christians. That's what my uncle Doug called them. Suffering Christians. You know why I called them that? Because they only come up on Easter and Christmas. That's when we see them. Do you know next Sunday is the number one Sunday of the year that most Americans will go if they're ever going to do it? I need to get into church somewhere because it's Easter. They'll show up. Now here's my promise to you as your pastor. I'm going to smack them right in the face with Jesus Christ. See, some guys will be like, no, now we need to make sure everything is pretty up real nice. We've got to have them. We're going to bring in them flowers and them lilies, and we're going to, we're going to give every, it's going to be, we're going to give candy away, and we're going to have all kinds of videos, and we're going to do all this. And we're going to, listen, we'll church it up. That's fine. But you know what we're not going to do? Water it down. Amen. So I'll make the promise to you, if you show up, I'll preach a case for Jesus. Like, we're going to hit pause on Ezra. I know, break your heart. And we're going to preach Jesus crucified. Hard. Because I believe next week may be a time that you could sneak your friends in without them knowing it. We used to do this at the edge all the time. The youth ministry, that's what you would do. We'd be like, hey, we're having a big wire event. Woohoo! We're going to have inflatables and give away TVs. We're going to blow stuff up. We're going to have dance teams. We're going to invite. There's going to be girls, young men. Girls in the building. <laughs> Come on down. Candy and hot dogs and video games. And people will be like, don't you think sometimes maybe all that stuff, people get distracted? No, stupid, we're fishing. You know how you catch fish? Bait. bait. Mm -hmm. All that garbage is bait. Put all that bait out there. And then when they bring them in that room, we are going to preach Jesus resurrected and crucified for the forgiveness of sin. We ain't going to pull punches. We're going to call people out of darkness. We're going to say you can be restored because that's what God called us to do. Amen. So when you talk about a message that says stop procrastinating and rebuilding the temple and the next week is Easter, sometimes you go, maybe God does order a preaching calendar. Because you have an opportunity this week to invite all your wayward friends because guess what? This is the one time a year that they're going to be like, all right, probably need to show up to church. It'll make my mom happy. Invite them. Get them here. And then let's pray and let's believe this week that we will have the same moment like they had in this story. That they will have a moment where we will have Darius speak on our behalf. And we will have our God say, hey, this is true. Yep. That note did take place. And listen, you're going to honor this and respect us. You're going to come face to face with a God who loves you and created you. Let's pray and believe as a church that people who show up next week who maybe wouldn't show up any other time will have an experience with the God who created them. Let's believe for restoration, but then let's not just leave that on Easter. Let's always be a church that jumps in the deep end. Right? We want to be that crazy kid. We all know that kid. Right? You go to the pool. Do you ever know how to swim? Nobody's real sure. And then you always have that one kid that's like, woo, in the deep end. Can he swim? Oh, no. And he went. Like, that's how we need to approach our faith. That's how we need to approach lost people. That's how you need to approach thinking about people being a part of this thing. That's how you need to think about your friends. Are they going to listen to me? I don't know. Are, is this safe? I don't know. Are they going to make fun of me? I don't know. Are they going to judge me? I don't know. Do I know everything to say? I don't know. But I'm doing it. I'm stepping out in faith. I'm doing it. Because I believe there's a living, breathing God who is working inside of me. And he'll give me the answers. He'll give me the things to say. 
or he'll give me the wisdom on what to do into this situation so that they'll hear me because I don't want when it's said and done and I stand before the Father and we look back at the world in darkness I don't want there to be friends or family who are lost out there that I went hey I know him I know her I knew them why are they out there because you never said anything you never communicated who I am inside of you they don't know how to live because you were supposed to talk about it and you never did it. And they wandered in darkness and they wandered broken and they wandered lost. And you had the answer and you said nothing. Because you were concerned about your throw pillows and the way your house looks. And you're not concerned about the fact that you want the temple built so that the world can see a living, breathing God at work. Let's be a church that always keeps that at the forefront of who we are. Lord, I come to you today and I lift the vintage up to you. Lord, I thank you first and foremost for every heart in this room. Lord, I know that there is a passion for lost people amongst those who attend and are a part of vintage. Lord, I thank you that you've given us this group to pastor. Lord, I thank you that when you hear a message like this, I don't worry about there being animosity or frustration, but it's just open hearts and open minds. Lord, help us to be faithful. Confront us about procrastination. Confront us if we are wasting time. Confront us if we're focusing on things that are not what we should be focusing on. Help us to keep your path in front of us. Lord, Grow us up to be aware of when we should be stepping out. Make us aware when it's time for preparation. Make us aware when it's time to get moving. And then, Lord, I pray that you would be in each and every one of us. Overcome our shortcomings. Overcome our weaknesses. Overcome the things that we are worried about, our fear, our anxiety, the things that we keep us from being who you want us to be. Lord, we want to always be faithful to do what it is you've called us to do. And then, Lord, I pray for every wayward son and every wayward daughter that we are in their life in this room. Every family member, every co-worker, every friend, every person who is skeptic, every person who is agnostic, every atheist, every person that we know that questions the validity of who you are. Lord, I pray this week would be a preparation of their heart, that, Lord, you would lay open the battlefield of their mind, that, Lord, you would begin to prep them for the truth of your word. Lord, we pray and believe for an outpouring of the reconciliation and restoration of your cross and your spirit on Easter Sunday. Lord, I pray you put the right people in this room. Lord, we're not praying for massive numbers. We're not praying for as many possible people. I don't want that. What I want is the right people. Lord, I want you to bring a fertile group of people in this room who are open to receive what it is that you have for them. Lord, I pray that next week would be a time of restoration and reconciliation. That, Lord, we would be able to keep you in the forefront. Lord, I pray that hearts and minds would be open for what it is that you have and that next week would be a time that people would plant themselves in this temple. They'd become another brick in this wall. That, Lord, they would be bound to who we are because they showed up on an Easter because the people who are here this week were faithful and invited. They didn't procrastinate. They stepped out in faith. They got up here on an Easter Sunday. Lord, we thank you for what it is you're going to accomplish. We thank you for who you are and what it is you're going to do. And now, Lord, we pray and believe that over this church this morning. Lord, it's in your gracious name we pray. Amen.